Yes. Okay. Uh, so uh, we'll start now. So feel free to ask any doubts. Also, uh, like I I will not be able to see the chat. So it would be nice if you could speak up. Uh, so uh, let me start now. Uh, so uh, we'll do projective geometry. Uh, so uh, let's start. Okay. So uh, uh, normally, like we deal with our normal plane. Uh, so uh, in this in this lecture, we'll deal with a special sort of plane. So. In our normal plane, uh, we have that let's say two points A and B. Uh, they have a, a unique common line. So, uh, but if we have like two lines, uh, then they don't necessarily cut at a common point, a unique common point. Uh, they don't cut when they are they are like parallel. So. Uh, we want to avoid such a situation. Uh, so we will construct a new plane, uh, which we will call, uh, let's say, which we will call P. Uh, and this will have the property that any two lines, whether they are, they are parallel or not, uh, cut at exactly one unique point and every two points uh, have a common line, like a unique common line. So uh yeah so to do that uh, what we will do is uh for each parallel a uh, set of parallel lines we will assign a point uh, which is their common concurrency point so uh, for now for now just take it uh, like on intuition and we will define it rigorously uh, the next so uh, like for this situation to so that our new plane is nice we will call this point we will uh, like define this point as the concurrency point of uh, these all these parallel lines and we will call this as the point at infinity along this line and similarly because we also need that every two points have a common line a unique line we will also define that two points at infinity. Uh, okay, we will also define that there is a line at infinity uh, which contains all points at infinity. So now we can see that our new plane by like uh, we extend the normal plane to our new plane called the projective plane which we will like throughout the lecture refer as p so this plane satisfies that every two points uh, two distinct points have a unique common line and every two distinct lines cut at a unique point uh, so let's like rigorously define this and wait yeah so uh, so oh, I first to confirm one thing uh, so yeah. All the all the points at infinity are on a single line. Yeah. So uh, this might seem a bit unsettling. So uh, we actually nicely define this now. So now we will consider R P square, which is uh, essentially the projective plane only, but it is a bit different. So uh, the R P square is defined as a set of uh, a set of projective points. So what are projective points? So projective points, like we work in 3D from now on, like, yeah. So projective points, we define projective points as a line through origin in 3D. Uh, you will see in a minute why this is useful. So this is our projective point. Uh, projective point uh, projective so and so we can also write it as this which is just saying take 
a point here and its coordinates are x y z and then uh, this is our uh, projective point so uh, so as our projective point is actually a line we want this uh, to be true this thing like x colon y colon z is uh, kx uh, ky kz because like these are the same thing uh, you can see this like as an equivalence relation maybe so this is equivalent to this and this whole thing is an object which we call the projective point so now uh, we will also define projective lines as a plane through origin like yeah a plane through origin so uh, a plane through origin means a plane through origin in 3d we define this as a projective line like uh, take a plane through origin in 3d then this is called as a projective line uh, you will okay. see in a minute why this is uh, all this like so again we can represent this uh, by this equation but and uh, yeah so we can represent this by this because this is like a unique plane where all a b c are not zero so yeah this is a unique plane and again like we want uh, this to be equivalent to this because these are the same plane you can view this also as an equivalence relation for now for now like forget about this stuff uh, we'll just do lines and planes so uh, to recap a line is a line through origin is actually a projective point we call it that and a plane through origin we call it a projective line so uh, now let's see why this type of thing is the same as this type of thing that we defined so yeah also uh, we we say that a projective point lies on a projective line if the line through origin lies the line through origin corresponding to the projective point like this is the projective point this lies on the plane through origin uh, which corresponds to the projective line if this happens then we call this projective point lies on uh, this uh, that projective line like this projective point lies on this projective line so now okay so take the plane z is equal to 1 so this is uh, let's call it a this is the plane z is equal to 1 and this capital p is uh, the whole line which is actually a projective point so we associate this if it cuts a as the small p this this thing this which is uh, our usual point and we correspond a line which cuts uh, z is equal to 1 uh, z is equal to 1 uh, as this line which is the intersection of these two planes and uh, now we can actually define what this means line at infinity and points at infinity so uh, see here like this is the plane so z I is equal to yeah uh, yeah, in this one, uh, that shaded one is a projective line, right? Ha, this L so, is a projective line. Yeah, so all the points are not defined according to the projective plane. Because uh, that according to the definition of projective point, it should pass through origin. But like all the points do not pass through origin, right? Here, if you draw any point, any projective uh, point on this. No, uh... Okay, yeah, so the lines through origin are known as projective points. So, uh, yeah. which points are you referring to? Like, this is Maybe a like complete... the small L line, the small L yeah. point uh, that doesn't is... pass through origin. Yeah, this is not uh, per se like a projective line. So, this is a normal line. All right. Yeah. So, 
uh, you'll see in a minute what I mean by all this. Yeah, so let's complete the definition maybe. Yeah, so uh, we basically did this because like we want to know why we are calling this thing a projective point like. So uh, basically what we hope to do is we extend, we are extending this plane A to a new sort of plane which which is what I described here. So we are extending this like uh, using RP square. So, uh, so if a line intersects A, then we we say that this projective point P corresponds to this normal point small p. And same uh, similarly, if this uh, projective line L cuts Z is equal to one, we say that uh, this projective line capital L corresponds to this uh, projective line, uh, uh, sorry, this normal line small l. Yeah. So now as for uh, the lines that complete lines through origin that lie completely in the plane uh, z is equal to zero, then uh, this doesn't cut z is equal to one. So we correspond this capital P, which is a projective line to this imaginary point P. Uh, this is just imaginary point, which is corresponding to uh, this line, this projective line, which doesn't cut Z is equal to one. So we will call this line as the, uh, this, sorry, we will call this point as the point at infinity along this line. And also the yeah. projective line z equal to one is a like fixed kind of line. Uh, like no, we are defining z all is the equal to one is not a projective line. That is I a mean, plane, that, a normal yeah. plane. A. So that is a fixed plane, or usually used, or it is just for understanding. Uh, so we will, we can uh, take any plane which doesn't pass through origin, but. Uh, just for uh, so that it is like just for convenience we are taking it z is equal to 1. Oh sure. Yeah. So uh, we are defining this thing which is a projective point. Uh, we are corresponding it to the point at infinity. We are just calling it a point at infinity uh, corresponding to this thing. And uh, for the line at infinity Consider the plane z is equal to zero. Uh, this is the only plane that doesn't cut z is equal to one. So we correspond this with an imaginary line L, which is called the line at infinity. So now uh, the new structure that we get is let's call z is equal to one a. Then the new structure which we get is uh, an extension of A, which we will call P throughout. And uh, this is the projective plane. Uh, so, yeah, so RP square and P are like, there is a bijection between RP square and P. And, but uh, like we define P because it is like much easier to work with. So, yeah, so now our new definition. So. By our definition, we constructed this sort of intuitive thing. Uh, now this and this sort of intuitive thing are the same. So like any doubts still now? Fe uh, the feels plane, uh, the yeah, so, uh, so what happens is that um, I joined a bit late. So maybe briefly, can you uh, just go, go, uh, go over? Uh, yeah. So essentially what we are doing is, uh, so our normal plane doesn't satisfy that any two lines cut at a unique point. So we are defining something nice, which we will call the projective plane, which does satisfy this condition that any two lines. Projective line. Right. Uh, no, this is not a projective line. Okay. So, uh, so. Like 
P and R P square are the same thing, but here we are uh, in intuitive sense talking about P. So uh, what we want is uh, this line and this line, which are parallel, also cut at a point, like a unique point. So for this, what we do is uh, we define. the concurrency point of parallel lines to be a point at infinity and uh, we define the line at infinity which passes through all this point now uh, to like make this rigorous sort of uh, then so because uh, we do like this so rp square is a set of projective points which as i explained are basically uh, we say a line through a region is a projective point and a plane through a region is a projective line we just say it and now we will show that this thing that uh, rp square is similar to what we intuitively see here this p so uh, how do we uh, construct the bijection we do like this so uh, p is a projective point And small p is the intersection with the plane z is equal to one, which we will call A. Uh, and then we correspond small p to capital P in this way, if they intersect. And uh, we correspond this capital L, which is a projective line, to the small l, if it cuts uh, z is equal to one. So note that for the time being, small l is not a projective line. Uh, capital L is a projective line. Uh, this is like a normal line. And for uh, the projective points, which are actually lines through a region, so for the projective points which do not cut z is equal to one, a is equal to z is equal to one. Like, oh wait, this is a, uh, which do not cut a. We correspond this to a an imaginary. In the name point. of the plane. A is yeah, the name a, of the plane. Okay. A is the name of z is equal to one, and we are trying to extend a to something called P, which satisfies this niceness condition. Like any two parallel line, parallel lines actually cut. So normal points in A correspond to this, and normal lines correspond to these projective points and projective lines, and uh, this projective. Point which doesn't cut A, i.e., uh, which lies on z is equal to zero. Mm, we correspond this with an imaginary point P, which we call as the uh, point at infinity along this direction, along this line. Uh, similarly, uh, line at infinity is like this plane. So observe that. a point at infinity lies on a line at infinity because this thing lies on uh, like the projective point passing through z is equal to 0 actually lies on l which is z is equal to 0 this plane and this is the line at infinity so now we got a bijection between rp square and uh, p this is this sort of extended plane z is equal to 1 we will refer to this as p throughout so uh, any doubts till now yeah so uh, the person who was asking for recap like so can you tell what r p square was here it was z equal to 1 the plane r p square uh, r p square is the projective plane uh, okay so like we will use p and r p square interchangeably but all right uh, okay uh, let's just do this thing uh, we will call real projective plane r p square and we will call p as projective plane oh, then what's the difference uh there is no difference there is like a bijection but uh like the definitions so, are different right so like uh, what is uh, uh, we do like we work on them interchangeably but uh, p is easier to work with in some sense p okay. is the extended plane z is equal to 1 which is we call projective plane and rp square is the set of lines through a region 
which are projective points yeah and we call we will call it real projective plane let's say Hello. so now note that okay, any can you say that p contains all projective points yeah uh, yeah, yeah. can say that p contains all uh, yeah so rp square is the plane uh, the plane rp square is set of uh, set of three i mean uh, this plane contains three uh, tuples like if we yes, are three set. Three talking about yeah 3d yeah. plane so we can see rp square as a set of three tuples with uh, this as an equivalence relation this is in like yeah this uh, we can take this as an equivalence relation and generate a three tuple which is the project so this satisfy p also uh no p is a different thing like p is uh there is a bijection between rp square and p that does not mean that p p has the same definition as uh, rp square so p okay. is our intuitive notion of this so we just rigorized it by showing a bijection between rp square and p so we will refer to p because it is easier to work with uh, nothing else like because we can not always do things with lines uh yeah so now like let's define something called cross ratio uh, this is very useful and like this is a sort of invariant which like is very useful in solving problems so uh for cross ratio we will work with directed lengths and directed angles uh so a directed length is ab Uh, we refer to it as this, and this is positive along vector a b along uh, a b direction and negative otherwise. And uh, directed angle we use like a uh, positive for anti clockwise and negative for clockwise, just as a convention. Yeah. So uh, let's first define this thing. So for three collinear distinct points. so here we are referring to our normal plane because uh, we are uh, we are not currently defining things for p or rp square we are just first defining things for a which is our normal plane let's say so for three points a b c which are collinear we define this thing as ac directed length divided by bc directed length uh, we need them to distinct, be distinct okay so uh, if we work in let's say p and allow c to be infinite point at infinity along this line along this line and let's say a and b are finite points for now then uh, we define ab comma point at infinity along this along let's say this line to be uh, one so this is this is intuitively true because ac is nearly equal to bc as c goes to infinity but we define it this way uh okay yeah so yeah let's do this also so uh, this is like an exercise so note that if a and b are finite points and c let's say x x varies along the line ab uh, x not equal to a x not equal to b and x can be equal to the infinity point along uh, the line ab then uh, like ax uh, this thing this thing uh, there is a bijection between this thing and r slash 0 Uh, by this i mean that uh, abx is not equal to aby for x not equal to y and abx covers everything so this can be just done by computation like uh, like for pos these are positive values these cover all negative values and this cover this covers all values greater than 1 this less than 1 and uh, the point at infinity covers equal to 
so uh, yeah uh, this is not really that useful we are just doing this for let's say completion or something okay so yeah so now we will define cross ratio for four normal points like our normal points in a yeah so uh, let's say uh, wait yeah okay so these are four normal points then we define this uh, we define this thing which is called cross ratio as uh the ratio of this thing that we define so yeah we define this as this and uh, this is equal to like this by definition of uh, this yeah so also now uh, we define cross ratio of four concurrent lines okay so first we define cross ratio for uh, yeah so let's just do this uh, cross ratio for uh, four concurrent lines l1 l2 l3 l4 uh, for now everything is normal we are not dealing with projective plane or something currently so uh, we define this cross ratio as like the directed sign the same same definition with sines and angles like sine directed angle l1 l let's say l1 l2 l3 l4 sine directed angles of l1 and 3 by sine directed angle of l2 l3 divided by sine directed angle of l1 and 4 by sine directed angle of l2 l4 now uh, there is a slight problem in this uh, so the orientation of lines matters but uh, but turns out that the cross ratio is still preserved so this you can check easily that if we change the orientation of one lines the uh, one line the cross ratio is preserved and uh, hence like proceeding similarly if we take any orientations of this line then its cross ratio is same as any other orientation of this line so this can be checked by checking this yeah so now comes the nice part yeah so uh, this is known as a fundamental theorem for cross ratios so turns out uh, let's do in this only for yeah take p a p b p uh, take a point p not on a line l uh, yeah, someone was saying so. uh, how that L1 L3 angle was defined with orientation again. Yeah, yes. Uh, so for two lines, you are asking about directed angles, how they are defined, or something. Yeah, between two lines, directed angles. Yeah, between two lines. so uh, okay, so there, there is a complication, but you can handle it. So we will first define directed angles between two rays as directed angle between rays l1 and l2 is uh, the angle this let's say which is negative for clockwise by convention negative and positive for anti clockwise so here like these are just rays as i mentioned uh, no matter what orientation you take you end up with the same cross ratio so this cross ratio is actually defined for rays rather than lines but orientation turns out that orientation doesn't really matter you can check this by checking that uh, under this procedure uh, the cross ratio is preserved and if it's in orientation of two lines like of l1 and l2 and maybe yeah. so then also it remains same you can deduce that by uh, doing this successively uh, yeah. like this cross ratio is this cross ratio and you can do this like uh, yeah, got yeah. Got yeah so like this is the main theorem 
this is something that provides us with a sort of invariant in geometry. So uh, let's just do it. So take a line L and take four points A, B, C, D, uh, distinct points, and take a point P not on L. Then uh, this theorem says that uh, the cross ratio P A P B uh, P C P D is same as the cross ratio A B C D. Yeah. So the proof of this. Theorem is uh, sign rule. So let's go but, over it. Uh, but I guess cross ratios were defined for points. So P A P B P C P D. Uh, cross uh, ratios were also defined for lines, right? Here. Yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah. So uh, this cross ratio. Uh, okay. So let's prove this theorem. Uh, note that directed A C. So for the time being. Assume without loss of generality that. Uh, uh, okay, so we'll just work in this this diagram. So, yeah, so AC directed divided by sine uh, a directed angle mm, between P A P C that is AC divided by this sine is equal to by sine rule P A divided by angle this. And now uh, we apply sine rule in PBC. Uh, this was sine rule in PAC. So BC directed divided by this directed sine is PB divided by sine again the same angle. So dividing these two, we have that uh, AC by AC this directed by this directed upon this sine directed by this sine directed. Is equal to P A by P B. So dividing these two, we get one. And similarly, we get two. And dividing uh, one and two, we get this thing, which is precisely this thing. So uh, we have proved that uh, the main theorem for cross ratios. Yeah. So, any doubts in this proof or something? Hi. Any doubts in this proof? It was good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, why no, this I is helpful is clear. because. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I understood that. Uh, I was saying why this is helpful. So, uh, so like this. So. Uh, these are four lines L1, L2, L3, L4, and uh, there are uh, four points A, B, C, D, and A dash B dash C dash D dash. Then, by uh, the theorem, we have that cross ratio of A, B, C, D is equal to cross is equal to cross ratio of these lines, which is equal to a cross ratio of these lines because the lines uh, the lines are same, like the lines are lines, and which is equal to the cross ratio of A dash B dash C dash D dash. So this is like very very helpful in geometry problems because, uh, like you can call this a process of projecting, and doing this process again and again uh, conserves uh, an invariant, preserves an invariant. So uh, let's do uh, an application of this problem. So uh, Pepper's theorem is. That uh, take two lines L one and L two, yeah. So take three points A, B, C, and on L one and D, E, F on L two. Then we have that A E intersection B D, B F intersection C E, and A F intersection C D are uh, collinear. Yeah. This looks so, like Pascal on lines. Uh, yeah. We can, I guess. Yeah. Oh, so here we can. It include. can be. So Pascal is also again cross ratio only. Pascal is also cross ratio, but on conics instead. So uh, let's just prove this. Like, I think we can introduce a point P, which is the intersection of L one and L two, 
and uh, then okay uh, wait yeah yes uh, then like oh, something of cross ratio seems to be helpful uh, yeah so if you are thinking this then p and x and y and z are collinear that is not true oh. uh, okay so uh so remember the idea is that we need to use this invariant that projection conserves the property of four points on a line uh so uh so join x and c uh what join a d c f then we can project from from the intersection of a d and c f i guess uh yeah uh, you were saying a e and c f maybe uh e b and c f okay so e b and c f yeah that also works so uh, for the sake of the proof like uh, we can project from anything i guess so we'll just extend like uh, az and dz to u and b so basically we want to construct a point to project from so now we have a point z to project from by extending this so by our invariant we know that the cross ratio of d e f v is same as the cross ratio of u c b a uh, so okay yeah great Okay, yeah, we need well, the point of projection. Uh, the point uh, of projection can lie on the line also. No, we are projecting uh, L one to L two from Z, so it doesn't lie on uh, L one and L two. Yeah, so. Yeah, also fine. i thought p uh, this is a fact that a b c d the cross ratio of a b c d uh, yeah uh, let's just we need another things in this so this cross ratio is equal to uh, d c b a cross ratio this is true because of the definition uh, this definition uh, so you can easily check this wait uh, is my screen visible Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So by projection, we know that D E F V, uh, yeah, is equal to U C B A, U C B A, which is in turn equal to A B C U, because of this is a fact that A B C D is D C B A. which which is like direct checking so we have that this is this so we know that d e f the v cross ratio is a b c u cross ratio so now what we do is we project d e f v uh from a so this is equal to a d a e a f and let's say a z yeah so we have that this thing is d e f w v which is equal to this which is equal to a b c uh, v project in here we project from let's say d yeah so we have this d a d b d c uh, d u so we have this thing uh so now let's assume x y z aren't collinear so actually this is a lot times used in like olympiad problems that uh, this is a fact if a, a and b are a and d are two points and we have to show x y z is co are collinear then we usually do it like we prove that a d a x a y a z is the same cross ratio as d a d x d y d z so Uh, given that these cross ratios are equal, we project 
A to this line L. So, so AD, AX, AY, AZ becomes this thing. Uh, w is the intersection of AD and L. W, X, Y and Z, Z1. And this thing, uh, DA, DX, DY, DZ uh, becomes W, X, Y, Z2. Now, uh, if three points are same, uh, three corresponding points are same, then if the cross ratio is same, then the fourth point also has to be same. This can be checked by the exercise that we talked about, like uh, this one. Like, there is a bijection between uh, this thing and r slash zero. So, this like, you can check this also, like, this is direct, that if two ratios are, uh, cross ratios are equal, and three corresponding points are equal, then the fourth one also has to be the same. Yeah, so, but if Z1 and Z2 are same, then, uh, then they are also equal to Z. Because, like, then uh, Z I has to lie. I couldn't understand how you wrote, like, A, D, A, X, A, Y, A, Z as W, X, Y, Z1. Because that four point should be collinear. So, X, Y, Z1 are collinear. And then X, Y, Z2 are similarly collinear. This directly shows. I mean... Like, yeah, Z1 it? and Z2 are defined... Okay, wait. Yeah. Z1 and Z2 are defined as AZ intersection L and DZ, DZ intersection L. Oh, okay, so basically you are taking two different points on the line WXY, right? Yeah. Oh, fine. Yeah, uh, uh, okay, yeah. You can see this is... See, this as we are assuming Z doesn't lie on XY. And then we are proving a contradiction. So if Z doesn't lie on XY, Z1 is not equal to Z2. But the cross ratios are equal, so this is equal to Z2. So it is a contradiction. Here, contradiction. Contra. Mm. So, yeah. So uh, in this figure only, uh, let's do another uh, theorem. So we have proved that uh, these four points... Uh, these three points are collinear and uh, we have also sh uh, so yeah okay let's do it in another diagram only so let a b c d be four points on l1 and e f g h be four points on l2 then uh, we have that a f intersection e b and uh, b a b g intersection uh, this these three intersection are collinear so uh, we prove this by applying papers again and again. So, by papers we have A, G and uh, call, yeah, by papers we have A, C and A, G lie on X, Y. By papers on A, B, C and E, F, G. So, we have these three are collinear. And we have uh, again by papers on A, C, D and E, G, H. Uh, we have that. X, okay, not A, C, G. A, B, D and E, F, H. Uh, by papers on these, we have that X, V, Z are collinear. So, uh, if we prove that uh, X, U, V are collinear, then we are done because then X, U, V are collinear. So, V lies on X U, X lies on X U, so Z also lies on X U, which means uh, that uh, because Y lies on X U, so X Y Z all lie on X U, so X Y Z collinear. So now we will prove. Uh, now we know that if uh, by this thing, which is like very useful, uh, we have to prove X. U, V are collinear, but that follows directly because this cross ratio is this cross ratio, which, which is the theorem, like this implies this is the theorem. So this is true because of that thing only that uh, projecting from this point and this point, we have that uh, the cross ratio of this 
E A E B E A E X E U E V, which is E A E B E C E D, is same as A E A X A U A V. So, this means that uh, these uh, these two are collinear. Uh, yeah, these three, which finish finishes this proof. Yeah. So, any doubts till now? Okay, can you just hold the hold the thermometer? Yeah, uh, this is the two. Oh, okay. So uh, basically, if uh, A B crosses of A B C D and E F G H are equal, then uh, the intersection of uh, like all these points will be collinear, right? X yeah. U Y B Z. Everything will be collinear. And will the will the intersection point of these three lines still same? I mean, is uh, that a... no, that is not true. Uh, so yeah, so uh, now we will uh, till now we defined cross ratio for normal points. So uh, we would like to define the cross ratio for projective points. So, uh, like, there are two ways of doing this. Uh, one thing we can do casework and, like, define for define the cross ratio for different cases. But, uh, so, in order to uh, avoid casework using like, uh, we cannot uh, we we cannot really define a b c a p infinity or let's say four points at infinity. The same way we define for four normal points because the lengths don't make any sense in in terms of p infinity. So what we will do is define uh, the cross ratios in R p square, which is the set of lines through origin. Uh, we will define the cross ratios in R p square, and then uh, that is. Uh, equivalent to defining this for p because there is a bit bijection between r p square and p yeah so yeah uh, let's define the cross ratio for projective points first yeah so uh, if a b c d r belongs to r p square are projective points uh, we say that four points which are projective lie on a single line which is projective so four projective points are collinear actually means that the four projective points which are actually lines through origin are coplanar because uh, what it means for four projective points in rp square to be collinear is that they must lie on a projective line but a projective line is actually a plane so uh, for four points to mean uh, to be collinear in uh, RP square means for uh, for the lines through origin to be coplanar. Yeah. So wait. Huh. So now we can directly define. So this is origin. Uh, wait. Let's go to that diagram. Okay, uh, we'll make another one of you. Wait. Yeah, so if uh, this is origin, then the cross ratio of uh, these are projective points A, B, C, D. The cross ratio of these four projective points is defined by the cross, cross ratio for four lines the same way as we defined, like uh, because these are coplanar. So uh, these are coplanar, hence uh, we can define their cross ratio uh, directly as sine this upon sine this upon uh, divided by sine this upon sine this. The same definition that we used for normal lines. Yeah. So so uh, we are doing uh, defining this for R P square because like. Uh, to basically to avoid cases so similarly for projective lines which are 
planes concurrent uh, for projective lines l1 l2 l3 l4 uh, to be concurrent means to have a common point which is a line through origin so this is a line through origin and these are the four planes l1 l2 l3 l4 so uh, for these to be concurrent means that they must have a common line which is actually a projective point let's call this p so we define this cross ratio as uh, as uh, take a line through origin uh, which is uh, perpendicular to their common projective point so uh, basically uh, we do this by the same angle definition for planes so to define angle between two planes we can do this by uh, doing uh, by taking let's say this is the common projective point for the four lines then take origin then there is a unique this type of uh, this point projective point yeah so which is uh, yeah a line through origin which is perpendicular to this uh, this p but all and lies on this plane so take these four lines take these four lines and uh, these lie on the plane perpendicular to this common projective point and define the cross ratio of these four planes to be the same as for these lines which are like these are normal lines so now we have this definition so uh, we basically did this to just uh, define it so that we have a good definition for lines and points in rp square otherwise we would have to resort to cases so now we will prove the fundamental theorem for uh, for projective points in rp square so uh, uh, this is like uh, the way we do this is we know the fundamental theorem for normal lines and we apply this again and again so yeah yeah so isn't the projective planes uh, and all more complicated like than synthetic is yeah there are difference? complicated but like again i did this because uh, otherwise we would yeah so we can do this also by defining uh, differently for uh, taking three points and one point at infinity and defining differently and for four points at infinity and defining differently but uh, that is like a bit of case work so i just did this this is actually a little more complicated than but yeah so the proof uh, uses like this extensively so uh yeah so what we want to prove is that if we have four projective uh, projective lines l1 l2 l3 and l4 then uh and we have four projective points lying on this which are the uh, which are a b c d the small blue lines these small blue lines are the projective points lying on the projective lines l1 l2 l3 and l4 then we want to show that their cross ratio the planes cross ratio is same as the cross ratio of these lines so what we do is take a normal point uh, this is not a projective point take a point point small p yeah let's do here take a point small p on this projective point capital p which is not the origin and project from uh, project from p this plane this plane which is let's say a projective line l containing the points a b c d to the plane perpendicular to this projective point uh, this p project which is a projective point so 
uh, this sort of plane here like yeah so then we have that uh, okay so note that when we project from a point p a plane to a plane then lines go to lines because because this line and this point have a unique plane and intersection of two planes is a line so we project uh, this uh, the cross ratio uh, these four lines to the perpendicular plane then origin goes to origin like this is the common point of the two planes and the lines precisely go to four lines which are exactly these red lines for these four planes because these red lines were defined as uh, the planes intersection a perpendicular plane of uh, a perpendicular plane perpendicular to p then uh, notice that if we just take uh, these are the four lines if we just take four points on here then they also go to four points in here which are collinear again because lines go to lines then by okay so let's do here so uh, by applying the fundamental theorem for normal points in this plane and then applying fundamental theorem uh, in these both planes we get uh, call this o we get that the cross ratio of these four lines is same as the cross ratio of these four points which is the same as the cross ratio of these four points which is the same as the cross ratio of these four lines and by definition cross ratio of these four lines is the cross ratio of these four planes so we have proved like this the fundamental theorem so any doubts in this part so this is like uh, a more trickier than using p but uh, we use this because uh, yeah so we use this just to have a general definition hi so any doubts in this proof no okay yeah so now we can check that this definition uh the definition of cross ratios for wait yeah cross ratios for projective points uh this is the cross ratio for these lines and if we intersect this with a or let's say p then this is consistent with the cross ratio of uh the cross ratio for normal points that we defined because of again the fundamental theorem and similarly one can check that this definition is this definition is consistent uh with the definition uh for normal lines uh, like you can use the two fundamental theorems for uh checking this so uh this is like this is left as an exercise yeah uh, so now we will do linear algebra like this is basic linear algebra and then we will do linear uh, projective transformations so uh, till here uh, again any doubt uh, where anywhere like, you can ask freely okay so uh, now we will do a little bit linear algebra so in linear in linear algebra we have a vector space v over a field f uh, if you don't know this terms don't get intimidated just uh, like we will anyways work with r cube and r so this is just uh, just ignore if you like 
don't know this thing. So, yeah, and we have like a set of vectors and an addition operation and multiplication by scalar. So, this was just general. Now, we will work with vector spaces. Uh, we will work with vectors in R cube. Now, uh, what is a vector in R cube? In R cube, a vector is uh, this. So, let's say this is like R cube. So, we take A, B, C as a vector in R cube. So, for intuitive understanding, you can refer to this as this vector. And now we define additions, um, addition and scalar multiplication. Scalar, by scalar, we refer to any, any element of R, any real number, lambda. And we define, if we call this vector V, then we define lambda into V as lambda A, lambda B, lambda C. So basically translating this to this. And we define addition uh, V1 plus V2 as if V1 is A, B, C, V2 is D, E, F. Then V1 plus V2 is defined as A plus D, B plus E, C plus F. Again, you can refer to this as uh, the parallelogram law or triangle law of vector addition. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, we say, now uh, we will do a couple of definitions. So, a linearly independent set of vectors in R cube v1, v2, till, till, till vk, uh, a set of vectors in R cube is called linearly independent if these are scalars alpha by uh, yeah these are real numbers if there exist if there ex uh, okay sorry no yeah we call these vectors linearly independent if this thing is equal to zero implies all the reals are zero so uh, in another way we, uh, these are linearly independent if this thing is never zero except for the trivial case. So, for example, uh, two vectors uh, in R cube uh, which are not collinear are linearly independent because if you multiply anything by alpha 1 and uh, this by alpha 2, you you can only get to zero if this scalar is also zero and that scalar is also zero. Like alpha one is also zero and alpha two is also zero. Now, we say a set of vectors in R cube is linearly dependent if they are not linearly independent. Now, uh, the span of vectors is the set uh, given by alpha 1 v1 uh, so the span of vectors v1 to vk is uh, the set s uh, given by this uh, linear summation uh, where alpha uh, these uh, like the scalars belongs to reals so this whole set is referred to as the span of uh, the vectors this and uh, vectors v1 to vk are called spanning if the span of v1 to vk is r cube like the whole set this means that if uh, like the there is just a linear summation for every element of r cube now to get more familiarized let's do two exercises so this exercise and this exercise. Uh, so first prove that if v1, v2 till vk are linearly independent, then no two linear combinations of these vectors are the same. Uh, anybody want to give it a try? 
like just use the definition yeah so uh so suppose there exist two linear combinations which are alpha 1 alpha 2 till alpha 1 v1 plus alpha 2 v2 plus alpha k v k and uh, beta 1 v1 plus beta 2 v2 and so on till beta k v k then if these are equal then we have alpha 1 minus beta 1 v1 plus alpha 2 minus beta 2 v2 and so on alpha k minus beta k vk is 0 but by our definition of v1 v2 till vk as linearly independent we know that if a linear summation of them is 0 then each has to be 0 which means that alpha 1 is beta 1 alpha 2 is beta 2 and so on uh, so this is now uh, let's prove that if vk plus 1 is in the span of v1 v2 till vk and span of this is just uh, hello uh, was someone speaking hello am i audible yeah yeah uh, yes. okay. so if uh, vk plus 1 is in the span of v1 v2 till vk then uh, okay sorry these uh, these k plus 1 vectors are linearly dependent so by this we mean that we can get a linear combination uh, which turns out to be 0 so this can be done by like definition chasing so vk plus 1 is some linear combination of these vectors and uh, thus we have that vk plus 1 minus alpha 1 v1 minus alpha 2 v2 and so on is 0 but as the coefficient of vk plus 1 is 1 which is not 0 we get a linear uh, we get a linear summation which is 0 but all the elements aren't 0 so these are linearly dependent yeah now a basis is called a set of vectors uh, which is both spanning and linearly independent. Yeah, now we will prove this theorem. So, uh, the cardinality of linearly, in, linearly independent set is at most the cardinality of, cardinality of a spanning set of vectors. So, uh, for this, take uh, assume the contrary so take v1 v2 till vk which are linearly independent and u1 u2 till ul ul which are spanning and k greater than l so what we will do that we will first uh, we will uh, uh, do some sort of algorithm uh, by which we interchange uh, each ui with some vi uh, vj i mean so so first let v1 is equal to this because this is spanning this also spans each of these elements so v1 will be equal to some combination of this stuff then also all of these alpha is can't be zero because otherwise v1 will be zero but any any set which contains zero is not linearly independent this is because like the zero is zero like one into zero is zero so yeah so uh, w log we can assume that uh, alpha one is not equal to zero let's say 
then we have u1 is in the span of v1 v2 v1 u2 till, till, till ul because u1 can be written as this thing so what we did is so if u1 is in the span of this thing then of course u2 u3 till ul are in the span of this thing so because you if a set has if in the span of a set there are all these elements then the set is spanning because uh, you can take because this set is spanning and a so a linear combination of this generates everything and if each of these is a linear combination of some other set then uh, so if this is the thing then you can just replace this by a linear combination of other set and that whole uh, thing after like cancellation and all that uh, is a linear combination which is equal to a random number this thing so we have that this set of vectors is also spanning spanning yeah because u1 is in the span of this and u2 uh, till ul are already elements so what we did what we did was uh, we took this a uh, linearly independent this linearly uh, dependent no this spanning that uh, we constructed another spanning set now consider uh, consider v2 then we have v2 is not in the span of v because otherwise they can't be linearly independent so v2 must be some combination like this because this is spanning where sum of alpha 2 alpha 3 not all of this can be zero something must be non-zero so again without loss of generality let alpha 2 be non-zero then we again have that in the span of v1 v2 u3 and so on till ul this is a spanning set because this spans u2 again by by the similar method like u2 is equal to v2 minus alpha 1 v1 minus alpha 3 u3 and so on divided by alpha 2 and this is non zero so we have that this set is spanning so if we keep repeating this process, we ultimately get that V1, V2 till VL is spanning. But then VL plus 1 is in the span of this set. But we know that this is linearly independent. And uh, by exercise 4, exercise 5, we have that this cannot, there cannot be an element in this, which is in the span of other elements. So, but VL plus 1 exists because L plus 1 less equal K and VL plus 1 is in the span of this, which is a contradiction. Uh, so, we wrote this theorem. Uh, any doubts in this particular theorem? Okay, so, uh, by this theorem, we have uh, this nice fact that the cardinality of two bases is the same. And here we are assuming that a basis exists. So we are working in R3. So yeah, so note that uh, first do this. Let's do uh, so R3 has a basis this because R3 is by definition ABC and this can be written as A times 100 zero zero plus B times 010. Zero plus c times plus c times 0, 0, 001 so now uh, we are proving that the cardinality of two different bases is the same so this is a corollary of the above fact because if they were not same then if there was a set s1 s2 both containing vectors was a basis and the cardinality of s1 is less than cardinality of s2 then this is actually also a linearly independent set and this is also a spanning set but by this we can't have this situation
so we have the cardinality of two different bases always the same yeah so uh, now let's do projective transformations okay so first let's define what a projective transformation is wait okay no sorry this is not projective transfer uh, okay yeah so we are still in linear algebra uh, projective transformation will come here so yeah so uh, linear uh, linear transformation uh, so what a linear transformation is is that uh, take v and w uh, to be vector spaces uh, by which we uh, we mean like r square or something like that like don't worry about general vector spaces right now uh, we'll just use r, r cube let's say then uh, a linear transformation t is a function defined uh, defined on vectors in v two vectors in u satisfying the linear relations satisfying these two relations so like by this we have t of 0 is 0 by plugging lambda is 0 and we also have that t of a linear combination uh, yeah so by these two theorems we directly have this sort of thing that t of uh, alpha 1 v1 plus and so on is equal to alpha 1 t of v1 plus alpha 2 t of v2 and so on just by successively applying these two uh, now like note that if let's say v1 v2 till vk is a basis of v uh, then uh, defining t of v1 t of v2 till t of vk to be like any vectors in w we have a valid definition we can uh, we construct so yeah let's do this so let v1 v2 vk be a basis be a basis in v basis then we define t of v1 till t of vk arbitrarily as vectors in w then we then we have by this thing that t of alpha 1 v1 plus and so on alpha k v k is alpha 1 t of v1 plus alpha k t of v k so we have that because this is a basis this is also spanning so this can generate every vector so by just knowing the values of these we know the values of any vector in the vector space v and also we cannot get a contradiction like we can actually define arbitrarily these uh, this is true because this is also linearly independent so like in any case uh, if we have something like uh, yeah so if we in any case violate these conditions we would have to get something like t of 0 is not equal to 0 in some sense but like these are linearly independent okay wait we can do this nicely also wait uh, let's not do this so uh, every vector can be written uniquely as this uh, this thing this is true for a basis because any vector can be written like this and there cannot be two distinct uh, summations because these are linearly independent so when we define this to be this quantity uh, like this is a valid definition because no two linear combinations are the same so this actually is a distinct element so we just define this to be this and we get the whole thing uh, 
uh, as a linear transformation and now we have to just check these for linear combinations of this so by this we got that like any linear transformations from v to w can be characterized by sending a basis in v to any uh, to any set in w yeah okay so now uh, we'll do this so a basis in r cube we know uh, okay wait i have to define dimension is right okay yeah wait so dimension is defined as the uh, dimension is defined as the unique cardinality of a basis and the cardinality is, is unique by this corollary so note that r cube has dimension 3 because we can find a basis this which has cardinality 3 so a basis in r cube is precisely three non coplanar vectors this is because like the span of two vectors non collinear is the plane the whole plane because any point can be uh, from any point take this parallel line this parallel line and it can be generated by uh, like the linear combination so we have that if three points uh, if three vectors lie on a plane then uh, this vector let's say v3 lies in the span of v1 and v2 which means that they can't be linearly independent uh, they can yeah they can't be linearly independent which means that they can't form a basis so uh, v1 v2 v3 if uh, these are uh, non coplanar then this form a base this forms a basis because uh, so any point in r cube uh, say not on yeah any point in r cube can be uh, we can draw a sort of parallel pipe uh, from this point uh, to get uh, wait. yeah so for any point here we can draw a parallel pipe with these as directions and then this is equal to this vector plus this vector plus this vector which are which is equal to alpha 1 v1 plus alpha 2 v2 plus alpha 3 v3 so this non coplanar vectors form a spanning set and also spanning set and also uh, a linearly independent set because the span of any two vectors is the plane through those and v3 doesn't lie on that so uh, this is precisely a basis of r cube yeah so any doubts in linear algebra part okay so uh, now we'll do projective transformations so a projective transformation is like a bijective function uh, phi from rp square to rp square uh, which has the property just that phi sends lines to lines and phi preserves cross ratio so yeah so uh, in in this part we refer again to like we refer to p as the uh, as the projective plane uh, we refer, refer refer to this as the real projective plane and this as the projective plane which is the extension of z is equal to y z is equal to 1 now uh, yeah so what do projective transformations uh, look like so uh, let's see this let lambda be uh, any plane and by plane we mean we mean the plane extension we mean that uh, along any line we also have points at infinity so let lambda be any plane and 
omega be another plane and let x be a point not on the two plane then uh uh define a map from lambda to omega as the projection like this point uh small lambda let's say goes to small omega this point so okay so for now like don't get confused between rp square and this weird thing uh so uh, let's not call it projective transformation uh yeah so we will just show that this preserves uh, uh sends lines to lines and preserves cross ratio so uh, this is uh, like the same thing that we did there two planes the projection from one plane to another uh yeah so the projection from one to one plane to another sends lines to lines because a line because the unique plane containing this line and point x cuts this plane at a line only so this sends lines to lines and also preserves cross ratio because again applying the fundamental theorem for normal points in we get that this preserves cross ratio for normal points and now because we have already done a fundamental theorem 2 so we also have that this preserves a uh, cross ratio for points at infinity uh because they can be projected from a point in this so if we have something like let's say this point set infinity there yeah, and this is infinity long uh, this line then we can take a point in the plane and uh project this uh for finite points and for finite points this preserves cross ratio also this is a bijection because because these are not normal planes these are extended planes so any any line through x cuts this plane exactly once even the lines that are uh, like that don't actually cut the normal so that's why this is like a bijection yeah so now in order to like view this as projective transformation from rp square to rp square we have that this preserves uh, sends lines to lines Uh, what we can do is uh, take this plane and uh, move it so that it becomes z is equal to one. Like, just rigidly move it to z is equal to one, and this is p, and that take the normal bijection from p to r p square, and take this plane and rigidly move it to z is equal to one. Then if this point uh this point small lambda goes to here and this point small omega goes to say here this is zero this is the plane p then our projective transformation from rp square to rp square sends this projective point to this projective point and similarly others so now by proving that this preserves lines and cross ratio we have proved that this thing uh, this projection from rp square to rp square is a projective transformation yeah so uh, in general what this uh, what we can do is Uh, to uh, to generate let's say a projective transformation take p and take uh, rigidly move p to some plane let's say lambda and the points corresponding to let's say 
small p goes to small lambda like then they, because this is this is just like a rigid motion this obviously preserves lines and cross ratios now project this on to p and or equivalently take these lines as uh, projective points in r p square then this is a projective transformation Uh, so, like we would like to characterize all projective transformations. So it is a good guess that uh, this type of projective transformation uh, cover everything, every projective transformation. But turns out this is not exactly true. We would have to do something like, let's say we would have to tweak this plane a little. Uh, and then rigidly move it and then take um, projections to cover every projective transformations. So, yeah, so uh, let's like we need to define affine transformations to actually characterize the projective transformations. So, let's like define. Uh, the fine transformation so uh, basically what this is is uh, take the vector space r square with the field r and take a linear transformation let's say t so in r square the linear transformations basically look uh, basically they are sending let's say i cap and j cap or some random vectors v and u let's take u1 and u2 instead u1 and u2 non-collinear this sends u1 and u2 to v1 and v2 and then any normal point uh, which is a u1 plus b u2 gets sent to a v1 plus b v2 yeah so this is a linear transformation in R square. So what a fine transformation is basically like just this only, but we have to define it so that it works for uh, points at infinity also. So let Q denote the extended plane R square. By this we mean uh, like uh, just take R square and add points at infinity and add a line at infinity. So this we will refer to as Q. So what an affine transformation is, is that uh, it is, it sends if this point, if this normal point gets sent to this point say. So yeah, so if this is this square, let's say sent, uh, is sent to this parallelogram, this point is sent uh, to this point, U is sent to V, then we sent this point, this normal point, to this normal point in Q also. And a point at infinity along, say, origin, along this direction, gets sent to a point at infinity along this direction, where this vector goes to this vector. Like, just take any, any point here. Uh, take this vector, this goes to this vector in this linear transformation then any uh, scalar multiplication of this vector also goes to some scalar multiplication like the same scalar multiplication so we have that the point at infinity along this goes to the point at infinity along uh, this vector so if this vector is u then the point at infinity along u goes to the point at infinity along t of u Yeah, so uh, basically a fine transformations looks uh, looks something like this. So we sort of stretch this paper to this. So it is uh, like exactly like this. Yeah, so. Okay, so now turns out that 
affine transformations actually preserve cross ratio and send line to lines to see that just note that a line if a line is actually u plus b lambda in terms of vectors in r square where lambda is an arbitrary real uh, because let's say this is origin this is any point on the line and this is the line vector any any vector on the line then we have that this lines is uh, all points of this form mm. yeah okay so uh Yeah, uh, let's do. Uh, let's just uh, on a define. Uh, do the projective transformation with uh, using a fine. So, uh, a fine transformation preserves cross ratio. Uh, you can check that uh, directly. Like, it sends lines to lines. Two lines and. Uh, it actually preserves like the ratio ab by bc is preserved a dash like b dash by b dash c dash let's say like the this ratio is preserved so it also preserves the cross ratio so now uh, observe that if we take this normal plane p and uh, do some Uh, like and take an affine transformation of this and uh, okay wait do an affine transformation of this this is the same plane and then rigidly move it to some other plane lambda and then again project to p again then this is also uh, a projective transformations because each step doesn't change anything Uh, each step doesn't change the fact that it sends lines to lines so it turns out that this actually covers uh, all the projective transformations okay so uh, let's uh, like uh, like uh, only a little bit is left so let's continue for like 5 10 minutes uh, i can give the idea of the proof so uh like the basic idea is uh first we prove two things uh one is that for any four points uh let's say a projective transformation from p to p this corresponds to a projective transformation for r to r p square to r p square but we just work in p because it is easier it sends these four points to these four points then we claim that this characterizes every other point uh, so the proof for this is something uh, yeah so the proof of this is like this that uh, intersect these two diagonals like yeah so this intersection goes to this because lines go to lines so if also if we have three points on a line going to three points on any other line uh we get the whole line we can characterize the whole line by cross ratio so a b c let's say a k a uh, yeah a b c d and a dash b dash c dash d dash uh yeah and if we know that let's say x y at a x c go correspondingly to a dash y dash c dash then any element let's say uh, lambda we can characterize beta uniquely by cross ratio lambda a x c is beta a dash y c dash so once we no every line so we can do the same thing by intersections of these two and these two which means that 
we know let's say three lines going to three other lines and we can characterize each point on this line go to a unique point in that line then take any other point and a line which cuts this as three points let's say alpha 1 alpha 2 alpha 3 then take uh, the intersections of these as gamma 1 gamma 2 gamma 3 which will lie on a line and because after characterizing three points the every other point is characterized we get a unique q corresponding to a p so this is the idea of the proof uh, yeah so this is one part now if we show that this type of transformation this type of transformation send sends four points in rp square to another four points in rp square then we are basically done uh, so yeah uh, we do this like this yeah so the four points are no three collinear so if it sends we want a projective transformation sending let's say these four point projective points in rp square to these four projective points in rp square so what we do is we take an affine transformation uh which sends this normal let's take this as p is equal to 1 uh, so i mean z is equal to 1 or let's say p so take three points on this and take an affine transformation sending three points these three points to let's say some other three points uh yeah on this then then for the fourth point we have that these three vectors points let's say these three vectors are u1 u2 u3 and v1 v2 v3 so the main idea is that u1 u2 u3 form a basis and v1 v2 v3 form a basis of r cube so uh so we can take any other point uh, theta let's say and here uh, alpha in this and in this then uh, we know there exists uh, there exist uh, p1 p2 p3 such that p1 u1 plus p2 u2 plus p3 u3 is equal to theta and q1 q2 q3 such that q1 u1 Uh, v1 plus q2 v2 plus q3 v3 is equal to alpha then uh, what we want is there to exist a linear transformation uh, sending uh, yeah so what we do is uh, if like we want these three to be pi's because okay so this thing here to here is uh, a linear transformation of r cube like we can send i j k to v3 v1 v2 this is a linear transformation of r cube which is also which is the same as doing an affine transformation in this and then rigidly moving yeah so what we do is we scale v1 v2 v3 by p1 by q1 to form v1 dash v2 dash p1 by q1 p2 by q1 p3 by q3 to form v1 dash uh, v2 dash and v3 dash then we have p1 v1 dash plus p2 v2 dash plus p3 v3 dash is p1 times uh, q1 by p1 v1 Uh, plus and uh, so on, which is Q one V one plus Q two V two and so on, which is actually alpha. So, if we take V one dash V two dash V three dash, then we have that the same un, uh, linear combination of these is alpha as the linear combination of these, which is theta. So, if we uh, take a linear transformation sending this basis. to v1 dash v2 dash v3 dash then it sends theta to alpha 
एंड दिस थिंग इज ओके सो लाइक या सो लाइक जस्ट वन मिनट दिस इज लाइक अ लीनियर ट्रांसफॉर्मेशन विच सेंस दिस हेलो या the spin share stop oh yeah okay so like maybe we can cover this a like only a little bit left so uh, maybe uh, we can cover this like in another lecture or something yeah so any doubts like okay i guess i can do one thing i'll do the projective transformations thing again in the next lecture so any doubts till that point okay uh, so bye i guess also yeah uh, you can ask any doubts like uh, on the chat like okay thank you